We're here for a very basic reason. In 2009, we started our little company and we started a program with Parliament, talking to parliamentarians about what they're involved in. Our interest primarily was to let the public know that Parliament is worth our while. And so we took time out, talked to parliamentarians from each side, minority, majority. Sometimes we'd bring in civil society organizations to talk as well. Um, typically to counter uh, what Parliament was doing most of the time because they didn't necessarily agree and sometimes to endorse what they were doing because they thought it was a good idea. The bottom line was that the public was being informed. We also had the objective of sort of bringing something to the fore, which is that in the past, from 1951 straight up to 19, even up to when we started in 2009, there never was really the opportunity given to those of us in the public to know exactly what was going on in Parliament. We'd get snippets of it in newspapers and magazines and newsreels on radio and television, but it was typically the sensational stuff. And so we needed to create an avenue to let people know that other things go on in Parliament. Excuse me to say there are other human beings in Parliament who are very knowledgeable about what they're doing there, and of course a few who don't know what they're doing, uh, but have won their seats uh, and are there. And so, but it's for them to protect their position and for us to just tell the world that this is what you voted for. And so that's what we've been trying to achieve over the last two years. In fact, May 19th will be exactly two years when we first broadcast. Today is a result of what we found out doing that work. There's too much information and too little of it being told to the public. And so we appear, and I say so with all humility, we appear ignorant of what we should know. And so we needed another platform to expose it and also to prompt thinking or to provoke thinking. So we're here today on the In the House Talk series. This is the second one. The first one was by Mr. Kojoyanka, president of the African University College of Communications. He gave us a speech on the media and parliament, an unavoidable marriage. It was held right here. And it was very insightful. We took that opportunity to launch our other platform, the magazine, which is out there for hopefully for you to acquire. Um, so these are the things we're trying to do to let the public know that Parliament is important to us. They do represent us. It is up to us to make some good decisions about how they represent us. Right? Today in particular, we've chosen the theme, stroke topic, perspectives on governance. And we've chosen speakers who we believe typically will speak for the quote-unquote Ghanaian. Chairman. The chairman we chose is Professor Kwasi Yanka. Simply put, he's a pro-vice-chancellor of the University of Ghana. For this purpose, he's also a very interesting character personally for me, and I say this with all humility again. If you've read his works, if you've listened to his speeches, he actually also carries the people's voice in his own unique way. So we thought that his moderating this event will be exciting. And so while I do this, I'd like to introduce Professor Kwasiyanka to our, our chairs. I am so happy to be here, and I will simply, uh, I don't know whether I've been authorized to introduce the speakers. I have the background of three of the speakers here with me, and I believe um, they will speak in the sequence uh, uh, given. Um, the first speaker, if I am to determine who this, do you have a sequence? Yes. Asan Kumar has described himself simply as a lawyer by profession, a senior lecturer at the Ghana School of Law, and managing partner at the Medbet Central Lecture in Ankuma, a very renowned law firm. He was one time director, and indeed, I have known him, and I was told he had been a very good guitarist in the past, and occasionally, years of his profession to play guitar. Um, Isan Kumar 
He's our very first speaker. He's an extremely brilliant young man. And I say young man for very good reasons. And he will not disappoint us in his presentation. Ace, take the floor, please. Well, um, my thoughts on governance. Thank you very much for this invitation. I, um, I, I, I always struggle to put stuff together. And I've struggled quite a bit to put my thoughts together. So allow me to do a, a bit of who I am, a bit of my academic side, and a bit of my legal side. Now, I believe that governance is not governance until, or unless and until it is good governance. Now, once you introduce words like good, people say, well, that is subjective. Who determines what is good and who is not? But we can only understand governance really well if we go back to the, 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 the philosophical underpinnings of how societies came to be together. And I can't start without referring to a man called Thomas Hobbes, who said that there was a time in the lives of men where there was the absence of political order and law, and human life was, in his words, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. He called it a state of nature, where people had unlimited natural freedoms, and that included what he calls the right to all things. And that there was a freedom to plunder, rape, murder, and there was an endless war of all against all. So to this end, men then, or men and women, especially the women, established a political community. Oh yeah, men think they are running things, but they are not. <laughs> That's the reality. Men and women established a political community a civil society through what he termed a social contract. Now, he's not only social contract theorist, but for my purposes, Thomas Hobbes is very appropriate. And then gained security in return for subjecting ourselves to governance. So he said, we were all like, like beasts, killing each other. But we saw that that wasn't good, so we subjected ourselves to governance. And, but he says that the governance must be governance by an absolute sovereign. And so he says that even if the sovereign's actions are arbitrary or, or tyrannical, any abuses are to, accept it, are to be accepted as the price for peace. Without a tyrannical, heavy-handed sovereign, we'll be murdering each other here right now. And so it is the price we pay for peace is to have an absolute sovereign. And he called this sovereign the Leviathan. Now, this is where my interest lies, because he actually borrowed the term Leviathan from the Bible, where the Leviathan is this mystical, mythical sea monster that nobody has ever seen. But in demonology, the Leviathan is one of the seven princes of hell, and hell's gatekeeper. Now, then my foray, a little foray into the Bible to see where he got this from was Job 41. And I like a version who says that, who says that and this writer of Job took a little bit of time to, de to describe the Leviathan. He calls this creature a creature without fear, which breathes fire, terrifies even the mighty. And this is the part that I like. And it's one you will not, quote, put on a leash for your girls, unquote. The Leviathan is so fearful that you will not even put him on a leash for your girls to take him out on a stroll. This is the kind of person that, according to Thomas Hobbes, we need to rule us. This is the kind of governance we need if we are going to live in peace. The Leviathan, you won't put him on a leash for your girls. So by the social contract created under the Leviathan, we entered into uh, individuals united into political societies by the process of mutual consent, abiding by common rules, because we need to protect ourselves from one another and from violence. And so for some people, the concept of governance is the concept of the Leviathan, a strong man, a strong woman leading us and saving us from ourselves. The other model that I want to suggest to you is what I'll call the Machiavellian friends. Now, Niccolo Machiavelli also came up with his philosophy about governance. And he says, society must be ruled by a prince. And he says that this prince should use evil to acquire political power. That's what Machiavelli said. 
that governance is when you have a prince who uses evil to acquire political power. He gives the example of one gentleman called Agathocles of Syracuse. And this man is praised for luring all the senators and rich men in the city into a, a room and killing all of them. And after that, quote, he occupied and held the principality of that city without any controversy. That is Machiavelli's prescription. Africa and Ghana, for that matter, has had its fair share, very big, huge fair share, of Leviathans and princes. Through laws passed and actions taken by almost every government ruler since colonial times, pre-colonial times, we have often been subjected to cruel governance by Leviathans and Machiavellian princes. You have in your constitution an indemnity clause which binds you to forgive trespasses. It says, forgive our trespasses, but the condition, the biblical condition, that as we forgive those who trespass against us, does not exist. <laughs> it's the effect and the governance of Leviathans still lives with us today. What is worse, that there are some among us who believe that governance is only when we have Leviathans and Machiavellian princes. But was their governance good? What is good governance? Governance is a process. It is not an end. And if you don't remember anything I say today, just remember that good governance is a process. The process where you and I can have a say in life. If it were an end, maybe the people of Libya would not, or some would not be revolting today. Because we are told that Libya is Earth's answer to God's heaven. Yet, there are some freedoms that you and I have that the Libyans want today. But as they say, we talk too much, Kwame. You talk too much on your show. There's too much talking. We need a strong man, a strong woman to lead us. That is the thought of the Leviathan and its supporters. Good governance requires participatory, transparent, and accountable leadership. We have come a long way as a country from the time when the Supreme Court chickened out of holding a president to his oath and told us that a presidential oath or a president can only be held to his oath by at, the, at the next election. Today, if our president swears an oath, the oath includes these words. Quote, that should I at any time break this oath of office, I shall submit myself to the laws of the Republic of Ghana and suffer the penalty for it. So help me God. So help you God, Mr. President. Amen. The late Justice Cecilia Grantian of Blessed Memory was able to uphold good governance and make rulings on it in her judgments. May God still bless her soul. The late Justice Edward Redu was also able to uphold good governance, to uphold the human rights of people. And I come to a close with a statement. To me, good governance means good riddance to Leviathans and Machiavellian princes. That is good governance. Good riddance to all the Leviathans you can think about and all the Mach Machiavellian princes. In our national anthem, we pray for God's help to, quote, resist oppressors' rule with all our will and might forevermore. We have a national creed to resist the rule of Leviathans and Machiavellian princes because it is not good governance. And I can't end without going to where Hobbes started from. That in the same Bible, we are told that God will, quote, break the heads of Leviathan in pieces and give his flesh to the people of the wilderness. May that happen to every Leviathan. Um, I thought about legitimacy. What really would make any government or governing system fair? The first thing that came to mind was legitimacy. And legitimacy for me, therefore, meant that we should have a very free and fair election. 18 months or a little over 18 months from now, we're going back to the polls. If some of us cast our minds back to what happened in 2008, where there's a potential for us as this beautiful country to get to the brink and actually fall off. And for those who believe that we are a beautiful country, God loves us more than anybody else, I say it's a lie. It behoves on all of us to ensure that the process, not just the event of casting ballots and counting votes, is clean. But the process itself, I believe, if people believe in the process that runs up to the event of the election, we can ensure good governance. 
if people believe that the structures that have been put in place, the Electoral Commission, um, even the printing of ballot papers, if people believe that deep down um, error is really what it is and it's not manufactured, it would give legitimacy to whoever eventually becomes the leader. That would be the start of good governance, I believe. And even though there will be problems, there should be mechanisms that can help to address these issues. And then also, I just thought about consensus targeting. Our politics in this country is such that it's a winner-take-all situation. I don't think it helps when it comes to the issues of good governance. So that if there's party A, the moment it is thrown out of power, every single appointee, sometimes to as low as drivers, lose their jobs. I don't think it's a healthy environment we're building for ourselves. Because in the process, we throw the good grain with the chaff. That is assuming there's chaff at all when we take over. These are issues or these are things that we need to look at. Else we'll lose good quality human resource in this country and we'll further divide and polarize what we have. We are already polarized, whether we like it or not. The division goes deeper than just being NDC or being MPP. There are latent tribal and ethnic divisions in this country. We like to paper over the cracks, and some of us who've had the benefit of living in uh, military barracks and other such places, because we're exposed to all manner of people from all kinds of places, we believe that we are, we are more Ghanaian, we are more open, we are more tolerant, but there is a certain constituency that is not as tolerant. And so that was one thing I also thought about, and now for somebody who works in the media, I